So this is this is um, going to be a demo running on on tap instances within our uh, NetApp labs, uh, but talking with a real <coughs> AMI deployed in AWS using an S3 bucket. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to. It basically falls into three phases. We'll show the initial configuration, uh, you know, from primary to secondary into cloud. So just setting up that proxy, that token exchange that I told you about. Uh, then I'll run through a couple of um, data protection workflows and a couple of restore workflows. Okay. So my production on type system is called NDAS Prime. My second one is called NDAS Sec, and uh, then we run into the cloud. So we're going to register this secondary cluster, which will be a single step copy and paste a token, and then we'll add the S3 bucket. This is a one-time configuration which requires extremely low skills for an IT generalist to perform. So all of my infrastructure has been spun up, all my services are running. It's a brand new NDAS instance. You know, you can see there's no jobs running. Uh, you can see down the bottom this protection environment rep represents the topology of the backup. So the primary to secondary to cloud. It's grayed out because I haven't done any configuration yet. Right? So uh, we've got these uh, small headings down the side there, so it's easy for someone to figure out where I need to be. And in this case, because it's a brand new uh, installation, the only thing I can do is set up that initial handshaking, if you like, in that secondary system. So that's basically the only thing that's active, so it's the only thing that we make available. And, and this an console is running on, on, on tap on So prem? this is a browser. I logged into basically an, an ELB instance, which is now plugging into the NDAS app running in the cloud. It's a, it's a browser. So it's interface. plugging into the cloud on tap, uh, cloud NDAS service. It, it is directly accessing the, the public IP address, Virtual specifically virtual. of the EC2 running the NDAS app in the cloud. It's, I'm it's, logged directly into an, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, it's via an ELB, but, but you know, basically yeah. into, the, into the EC2 instance, okay? So yeah, nothing I installed on premises. All I did was update my uh, secondary system to 9.5, and then I pulled the AMI down and, you know, started up our instances and uh, so on. All righty. So add the disk target. There we go. So this cryptic string, which we simply copy and paste, is a, a single use token. And that contains all of the communication methods, the authentication that will interface, that will get the ONTAP cluster talking to the cloud. So I paste this into System Manager. This is the one time that I have to zip out to System Manager. So again, note the authentication. Someone with admin privileges on that ONTAP cluster had to say, here is my token. I want to talk to that cloud instance, right? It's not like someone could go to the marketplace, spin up an NDAS instance, and then start randomly discovering you know, different, different customers' clusters, right? We've got to initiate it from the uh, cluster side. Having done that, simply just paste it in a string, right? That discovers my on-premises infrastructure. It's going to prompt in a second for a, um, some authentication, just some credentials, because the NDAS workflows are going to result in actually executing APIs on the ONTAP clusters to create volume backups and so on. Uh, so at this point, I have registered my NDAS secondary system. OK. And it's going to ask me at one time just to enter my cluster cluster credentials on this in order to enable uh, APIs to be executed. Okay, and now it's discovered my peered my primary system, and it'll ask for the authentication of that. So it's about three or four steps, quick panels, and I've done all the configuration I needed to do to get NDAS going. Okay, now uh, down here in the fine print, this has created all the cloud copy policies. Okay, so we create default policies for how often it will back up to cloud and how much we will keep them and so on. Okay, now you can see that it's lit up the primary to secondary environment, so it knows what I've got on premises. It's detected that I've got, in this case, six data volumes and summed up, and it says none of this is, is protected to cloud. What are you going to do next? Well, you've got to configure that cloud target. So in this case, this is my S3 bucket. Okay, so again, the only thing I can do right here now is to add my cloud target. So notice with that token exchange, you know, the end user didn't have to know anything about what VPC am I using, what subnets am I running, and you know, none of that AWS stuff, right? Uh, they would, their cloud architect, whoever created this bucket, would give them the parameters associated with their bucket, enter those in, and 
you know, that's, that's it, it's ready to go. Okay, so now I have these targets, which is where, what it's going to receive the backup. Okay, and now you can see, you know, it's, it's filled in, these same volumes are not protected to cloud, and I've now got my cloud target. So my three phase backup workflow is all ready to go. Okay, so um, that literally takes like two minutes, right? You know, if you know the, you, the parameters of your bucket, you could, you could do this in, in one minute or two minutes, right? So the next phase then will be to start backing up. So I will configure a workflow which will define policies for local snapshots, backup on-premises, and backup into cloud. Now, remember back on that dashboard, little circles, it detected six volumes. So each of these six volumes have been represented by what we call cards, these, these boxes here. So it says the name of the volume, the size of the volume, and so on. Now we've got filtering, acts, filtering methods and so on to, to compress this for larger environments. Uh, but we use this uh, abstract representation of these shields. So there's three of these little gray, green and gray shields under each card, which indicates the phase of the backup. So in this case, all of these volumes, again, because it's a brand new environment, have only local snapshot protection. The other two shields representing a secondary backup and then the cloud backup, they're grayed out, right? So of course, we'll see them change once we set up, kick off our first full backup. So I then I want to select a couple of volumes to protect. So I would hover over a volume and uh, it will automatically display a backup uh, clickable circle in like one second. I've got this, this demo has a recorded voice, so you know, I'm not exactly synchronizing to my recorded voiceover, but um, yeah. So once I hover over a volume, <coughs> it allows me to select it, and then notice now the protect button is, is, is lit up. Uh, but I could select one, two, five, however many volumes I have, and set it all up in the same, in the same workflow. So I'm going to back up two volumes, accounts two and my data one, and now it's going to show me the protection screen. So again, it's a fairly complex, you know, three phase backup. I now can select the policies for each of those phases. And remember, a policy is going to determine when do I back up, how often do I back up, how many snapshots do I keep, how long do I keep them. Where do those policies originate from? Where do they originate from? So, uh, and as when it went up, when I did that token discovery and, and it, it automatically detected existing policies that were already in place, like for primary to secondary snap mirror, mm -hmm. okay? And then it created new policies for copying to cloud because, you know, they didn't exist there, right. okay? So you would have the opportunity to create new policies yourself, to customize default policies and so on, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, you can, the most likely scenario is that, especially for something like copy to cloud, you'd have a standard policy for some of your data and another one for others, and you'd set your default so that you can just, oh, here it is, default policy, looks good, okay? And click protect once, and now you've set up a complete three-phase uh, protection workflow which is then going to automatically kick off its initial full backup and then get you into that cycle of doing uh, regular incremental backups. Okay. Now, note that while the, this, all this orchestration and so on, as I said, we're logged into an application running in the cloud. The actual backups, you know, in terms of like calculating what are the change blocks, you know, taking the snapshots, what am I going to send, that's all under the auspices of ONTAP, the same as it is with SnapMirror. So again, we have that split uh, where is the work control, where is the work performed in order to optimize uh, what's going to happen. Okay, so this is now clicked off the workflow. So it will now take the primary to secondary backup. Uh, we've got a progress screen, you know, first few times you do it, you know, you're going to be wanting to check in and make sure everything, everything worked out, right? And then after that, you'll just say, yeah, I know, I just click and, and I'm, I'm good that this is going. So it's kicked off, in this case, two jobs for the initial backup. So one job for each, each um, volume that I protected. And at that point, it completed. So you can see the second shield's already green. Okay, now copy to cloud takes some time. One of the reasons I didn't do a live demo here, because you know, who wants to wait for data to, to go to the cloud? Okay, so now wait for it there. It updated and now I can see I initially had six volumes not protected. I've now got four volumes not protected. And I've got two volumes going from primary to secondary, two volumes going from secondary to cloud. So that was about three clicks because I, I had an extra click because I selected two volumes, okay, to set up data protection and at that point I'm kind of done for the day. Yeah. Uh, just a question, a couple of questions. The network connectivity between my internal NetApp systems yeah. and uh, the cloud. It's yeah. Proxy, do I, can I go through proxies? Do I need uh, right. dedicated 
can I specify which interface to use? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, typically customers have something like a VPN or a direct connect, okay? Uh, we would support a proxy uh, if it's a transparent proxy. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's some work we, we could do to enable a non-transparent proxy, but essentially, the, when the initial deployment of Endas, we would give you the parameters that you need to set up in your cloud environment. You know, what are the ports you have to have open, the security groups and so on. Right. And so that would be done in the initial marketplace launch, but that's totally isolated and, and you know, cut away from, yep. you know, because now once that's in place, those paths are there and, and, and have at it, okay. Okay. Yeah, now, okay, so Endas has sent the data to the cloud. Uh, but the next step is to create the catalog that we talked about because, you know, we want to have the metadata available uh, for searching and restoring. So that's all happening in the background. There's nothing in the interface that says cataloging now or anything like that. You know, it's just, it's just going on. And the work there is mostly happening in the cloud app itself. So the, uh, the ONTAP cluster basically calculated what I need to send. Uh, it uh, encrypted and uh, also compressed it, so we'll provide additional compression on the data before we send it, again, to optimize that one traffic. It's sent it over, waited for acknowledgement, read it, you know, it's broken up into the less three objects and written and everything. And then in the background, the catalog is, is happening. So at that point, we basically got our, our work done with the first two volumes, you know, and we can, we can add more volumes and so on. So now we can see that our two jobs for primary and secondary are finished. All our shields are green. Everybody's, everybody's happy. So how would we do a restore? There. Oh, okay. So this is just some filtering options. You know, if I want to see, just show me all the volumes that aren't protected to cloud. You know, so I know which ones I need to, you know, if you don't want to kind of look at the eye chart of the shield. So we've got a few kind of manipulations around there just to uh, organize the data in, and present it in, a, in a, some different ways. Right. All right, so restore. We can restore volumes, we can restore individual files, and it's going to come back from the cloud uh, back to the location that I specify. So if I search, now this is the catalog search, right? I mean, it doesn't user wouldn't know that this is running in an EBS or whatever, but they just see a, a, something that they can search. So this is the volume level search. So it shows me the two volumes that I backed up. Because I just did this, right, there's only one version, but if it's happening every night, of course, over time, you'd see one, two, three, four, five, and you could select whichever, if you want to roll it back. Let's say it's a ransomware situation where I want to put my volume back to where it was two days ago before the, the bad people took over. So select a volume you know, literally point and click. Uh, I'm going to be restoring it to an a alternative location, so then I can compare and craft and, you know, copy data back or, or whatever it is I need to do. So identify a new volume location. In this case, it's going to be NDAS restore, and click to restore. So it's going to come back in the opposite path that it went, and uh, there's a job saying I'm restoring data. Tick, 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 tick. Back comes the file. Did encrypted in flight? So yes, yep, yep, yep. So yep, it, it would come out of the S3 bucket from its encrypted if the bucket was encrypted. But then yes, it's going to go back over TLS HTTPS. Yes, definitely. Okay, so copy from cloud, and we can. So when you're doing the restore, you're restoring to the secondary system or the primary system. It's going to end up to wherever I said, right? So when I selected the restore, there you go. Go back to here, okay. Uh, this is the name of my primary cluster and, and a volume. Now, this could be another cluster, right? It could even be a cloud volume on tap instance. Maybe I want to do kind of short-term on-demand restore into the cloud. You know, I can restore it back to anywhere that I want. I just happen to restore it back to my original. So it's going to go, it is, while we have this primary, secondary cloud workflow, it is going to temporarily reside on the secondary and then get snapped back to to snap restored back onto the, the primary, okay? But that will all be transparent, everything will clean up, and so on. Okay, so copy from cloud, tick, 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 tick. And we can uh, switch back to our client view and just confirm. So here are the two, uh, the original and the new directory. I've just mounted the restore volume into the namespace, so we can see that the two sets of files are identical, as you'd expect, because it's just a full you know, snap restore. So, seeing is believing. 
Alrighty, so you know that's a full volume restore, but you know again, typically users, the typical scenario is that user says, "Oh no, I deleted my important document. Can you get it back?" So uh, let's take a look at our, our user with uh, you know they've got the um, the data mounted on SVM, and they accidentally delete some of their important technical documents. So they call up the help desk and say, "Can you help me?" So these are in fact NetApp technical reports, and. Uh, so again, we go to the catalog, search file, start typing in a bit of pattern matching, uh, and up they come. Alrighty. Regex we check support. with the user. Pardon me? Regex support? Um, it'll be coming. Yeah, right now it's sort of asterisk, but um, yeah, certainly we can do that. And we're going to restore it back to the original location because the user just wants their data back. We could restore it back somewhere else again if they wanted to, to do multiple versions. Tick, tick, back comes the data. And we'll just check with the user. Wait for it. Wait, there it is. Okay, and uh, I haven't I haven't told Mr. Parisi that uh, Mr. Flex Group that he's he's the star of my demo, but you know he is now. So <laughs> there we go. So you know, hopefully that's a that's a flavor of the the simplicity of an interface. But regardless of the resilience, the scalability, the the sophistication of of a cloudy backend, that we can just make this look like a fairly simple, almost sort of iPhone ready kind of app. Uh, that pretty much anyone can, can pick up and use. That, that, that was our intent with the product. You said this is obviously for, <clears throat> for the generalist as a target. Yeah. But what's the levels of scalability in terms of how far you could push this in terms of number of systems, volumes of data backed up, restored, exclusive of the network the customer might have, of course. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, you know, there's a few different dimensions when you talk about scalability. I mean, an S3 bucket can basically go as big as you want, or you can have multiple S3 buckets. Uh, the catalog, though, is, is where it turns out that the rubber hits the road in terms of um, scalability. OK, so the catalog will be sitting on fast storage using, you know, inbuilt Amazon search to do that. Uh, I showed, of course, a very quick response time of searching in some files, but if you're now backing up several hundred thousand files a day or millions or whatever in a change rate and you're keeping that over time, you know, it's, it's going to grow. So the parameters and the guidance that we will give to customers uh, in the first release and then going forward will be scaled according to our assessment of uh, what customers will accept in terms of latency of restore time. And that's, I'm not just talking about bring back the data with the when, but really to get that response time back from the from the catalog. You know, search that because if I say users say search for a file, and then it takes me I don't know a minute or two minutes or whatever to go through a ginormous catalog, you know, that's that's not necessarily a user experience. So, again, we ha we have alternatives that we could do. Maybe we could choose not to index some data. Maybe we know that some data will only ever get restored as an entire block. So. There are choices and decisions that we can make which will dictate the scalability uh, that, that we will um, provide. And then there's also, there is still that cost effectiveness factor as well. You know, how much data will users really want to store in the cloud? And maybe that gets back to, hey, maybe I'll keep it on-prem anyway. Still get that sort of S3 kind of like interface, but not have to keep paying Google or Microsoft or whatever. Right. So it will be a, an expanding target as we, scale, as we you know, iterate on the application, uh, get the expectations around performance and, and what it is that our customers are wanting to do. I, you might be asking the same question, go on. Well, I don't think so, but there could be. One thing that almost all my customers that are starting to make those first steps into the cloud, if you can have the analytics to go look at what my snap configuration is and give me cost estimates, it's exactly the same question. I've had. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your yeah. Because as soon as we start talking data in the cloud, the first thing people keep asking me is, "Well, how much is this really going to cost me?" Plus, it also becomes a competitive tool, so I can say, "Well, you can ditch that other internal secondary copy and say, this is there's my cost projection.' And you know the data, you know what your compression is, you know their attention policy. Um, just say which region is it going to be in? How much will this cost me next year? Mm -hmm. That's that would be a godsend if you can do that. Also. Uh, was not a, uh, I don't know, I didn't see anything about the progression because yes, the, the interface was really simple, but actually, you know, how can I detect if there are problems on the network or, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. anything that could happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in demos, everything succeeds, right? Everything, no, yes, everything, yes, everything yes, is successful. Good. Yeah, no, yeah. No, so in, in reality, I mean, I showed you that panel with the jobs and the, and the succeed and failure. So the idea would be on, on a, the front dashboard, 
I mean, again, after you've gotten over that first, that first thing of, oh, wow, this really does work, then you really only want to get informed if something goes wrong, right? So the expectation would be that we would show a job that failed, allow you to click and drill down and so on. Now, there may be a certain level of uh, PD, you know, root cause analysis that we'd provide in the app, and then maybe some of it involves kind of getting into logs and so on later. So uh, we want to certainly give that starting point to an IT generalist to say, oh, I need to do something about that. And then depending on what was the source of the error, I mean, maybe a volume had disappeared or someone had deleted the volume and then my schedule is still going on, you know, it would give me an error like volume doesn't exist and, and so on. But in terms of latency network errors, now, on that also though, there's a certain amount of resiliency, of course, built into the application, right? The whole <coughs> copy into cloud protocol. I mean, if we get a temporary glitch in the network, we don't want just to fail your backup, right? We would keep the session open, we would retry, and if it has to restart, it's not gonna roll back all to the way beginning, you know, it's gonna, you know, there's checkpointing and so on that will keep more or less where else. So it should be, I would say, self-healing to a certain amount of uh, WAN idiosyncrasies and, and so on. So a combination of things like inbuilt resilience so that if something goes wrong, we can recover from that. Uh, but if there is something that literally causes a backup to be missed, yeah, then we'd report that on the activity screen and then allow that to be. And on the, on the performance side, uh, or more on the efficiency yeah. side, so uh, do you plan to add, a, I don't know, a throttling mechanism or something like that, mm -hmm. just to be sure that if you are uh, replicating uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of volumes, you have priorities, you have, you know, some, some mechanism to, right. to, to make it happen in the right way. Because yeah, 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 yeah. So again, I mean, with the ability to have policy granularity, I mean, we can divide up. I mean, if you know you have the sort of workload that after you've gotten past the original full baseline, it's a small change rate. And so I'll just back up all my 50 volumes all at the same time. That's fine. Now, ONTAP itself does a certain amount of, of, of control around that to stop too many sessions going on at the same time. If you have more sessions, it'll just sit and wait. And then yeah, but on the other the side, you don't have ONTAP. You, are, you have a, a bucket, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be basically controlled through the ONTAP scheduler, and it's, it's uh, load balancing and, and you know, uh, what do you call it, what, uh, throughput regulation mechanisms. So again, like I talked about that split model, certain parts are done within the app, the catalog and the orchestration, but certain parts of the management of the sending of data and receiving data is done on the ONTAP side. So again, we leverage all of that that's already built into ONTAP. Uh, so yeah. Now we also, in terms of efficiency, we would keep preserve the storage, the deduplication uh, storage efficiency that you've already garnered on your secondary copies and also the copy to cloud piece will attempt to apply additional compression as well so we compress the data over the WAN which again will reduce network utilization and the overall time elapsed to complete the backup. So, so if you delete volumes in on tap that are protected by yeah. NDAS, yeah. does it give you a warning or? Uh, if you delete, well, if you delete, go into somebody, to say, rogue administrator or whatever, uh, they're not, it's not going to tell you that um, NDAS, it wouldn't give you a specific message that says NDAS is protecting that. I mean, it's, it's going to give you your standard on tap messages. Are you sure you want to delete this volume? However, even if you delete the volume or delete a file, I mean, you've still set the policy on how many snapshots you want to keep and how long you're going to keep them. So if you've said, keep my last snapshot for 10 years, then you know, within 10 years, you're still going to be get that back. But we don't have a specific, um, in the <coughs> we don't today, have a specific thing that says, oh, this has a snap mirror relationship. It, you know, it's, we kind of allow you to delete it, but if you've backed it up, then you're still going to be able to get that back up back within, within the bounds of the policy that you had applied.